Hello, this is Lloyd Hopkins, founder and executive director of the Million Dollar Teacher Project, and you are back inside the teacher's lounge. Let's get right back to it. Um, one thing you talked about, because we kind of went down a rabbit hole with the compensation piece, you mentioned that there's other opportunities um, for teachers to um, um, get salary increases. And I think it's important for folks to know those, understand those for other teachers. Ideally, hopefully, we're creating an audience of teachers that are watching this. So can you talk to talk about some of those opportunities and what they are and how people can go about accessing those? Yeah, so of course. So when we talk about the base salary, that base salary is usually um, based off of a bachelor's degree. So of course, you know, moving forward with the education and, and increasing your self-worth, you will definitely um, increase your salary. But also, like if you're being a coach of any sort, usually there's stipends that go along with that that increase the income for you as a teacher. If you choose to do tutoring after school, those things can increase their summer opportunities, like summer school and other ways to teach students and, and even support teachers. Um, there's just lots of things that we are able to do as teachers that will add to the income that we have. And I think it's important to, um, <laughs> to move towards those opportunities so that you can, you can increase your salary. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, and I saw you kind of move. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, guys. Like, you no, don't understand how difficult this is. <laughs> we're still working out the visual aspects of this. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I lost my train of thought when that popped up. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't for you. They don't don't worry about what we're typing over here. You just focus on <laughs> and giving the information. Like Lloyd, I'm right. not a professional at this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, and obviously, neither am I. So we're in the same boat. Um, okay. What has been your favorite memory or story as a teacher? Oh wow. You know, not to be cliche, there's so many, but there are just so many as a teacher, like um, like the birthday parties that I've been invited to by my students, by parents coming in and, you know, in, like I've literally had parents cry and tell me how much they appreciated the things that I've done for their students. Um, those I will never forget. And it's funny because those same parents are the parents who walk in the door the first day they look at you, they judge you, and they decide you're not the right fit for their student. Mm. But there's kind of no options. This is what we're going to do. We're going to work this out together. And at the end of the year, they're the ones that are crying and telling me, oh, my gosh, can my kid please stay in your classroom? This was the best experience, and they love you. And those things are, they, they just move my heart because to gain a parent's trust, and have them appreciate what you've done for their child and see for themselves that you know you poured everything into them it it, it means everything to me so i have 10 12 stories like that that i i will never forget. that's amazing so one of the what i say it one of the great misconceptions especially in title one schools and and um and for those that don't know what a Title One school is, these are uh, schools that are that largely serve low income communities, large number of students on free and reduced lunch, um, serving underserved populations. Um, is that parents is parent involvement? That parents don't want to be involved. Parents aren't involved. Um, and one of the things we do through the classroom support team is look for ways. Um, to engage parents so we can increase parenting in involvement in the classroom. So it's more of a partnership and collaboration. Where I feel the issue really comes from is in relationship building. I think a lot of times uh, if you have a school leader that's looking down on the community that they're serving and is not really looking for ways to integrate themselves and ingratiate themselves into the community they're serving, there's gonna be a disconnect. And that disconnect plays itself out when a school is, you know, putting on a, a game night and no parents show up, you know, um, I think there, I think 
I think there have to be mechanisms to better build relationships and to make sure that we're not bringing our implicit biases into into the communities that we're trying to serve. So with you working in a Title I school, how do you go about approaching building relationships with parents? Um, what's your experience like in that arena? And maybe what are some tips that you can give to teachers to do it successfully? So although I agree with you with um, regard to it being administration's challenge and, and you know in addition to teachers to get parents on campus and involved I, I think the challenge is bigger than that i think there's not a true commitment from people outside of education you know and when i say that like the department of education uh, on a government level like if people really appreciated what we did as teachers and education and valued it i think parents would see that as well and they would realize it's important. I need to be here when my school calls for me. But it's just something that we miss out on as a nation, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, if we did do events and we invite parents, I, I do think administration does play a role in that because you cannot be disconnected. You know, I've been hearing conversations with what we have going on right now with Black Lives Matter and some of the challenges that we've been having with policing and saying that the police should be from the community. And I agree with that. But I also agree in education that you should have administration and teachers that are from the community because then people will feel like, you know, I know this person and, and I trust this person and not just with my kid. I, I, I trust them as a neighbor. I trust them and I want to see them. Oh, I didn't see her today. So they're having something at school and I know she'll be there. I'll come. It should just be the way that things are done. And, and I know and I can speak for Arizona because I'm here as a teacher in Arizona, but a lot of our teachers, unfortunately, come from different states with different cultures and they don't realize what it takes to work with our community and, and parents feel that disconnect. So it's important to be able to pull from your community so that you feel a sense of security. In addition to the fact, I think we face some challenging things here in Arizona with a lot of our parents being um, immigrants and some of the challenge that we have nationally with that in, in regard to immigration and immigrants and feeling unsafe coming to school. And, and it's sad that I have to say that, but I know a lot of our parents feel, you know, it's, it's not a safe environment and that shouldn't be the case. Yeah, I agree. And, and the, to, to your first point, you are talking about the culture change that needs to happen. And and I and, and again, I feel like that's our goal is how do we change the culture? How do we really elevate the esteem of this profession and 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 really bring to awareness all of our responsibility in supporting this work, you know? So there definitely has to be a culture change. And it is sad how the stuff going on politically in our, or in our national landscape also affects our communities. And that's why it's so important to vote. It's so important for people to get out, Absolutely. use your voice, and not only vote, but hold accountable. Because yeah. I also think there's not a conversation, there's not enough, people think that it stops as the vote. People have to understand that the way you really make push for change, especially legislatively, is you have to be active. Uh, so you have to start by voting local. Uh, you have to vote and vote often. And then when you put that vote, be prepared to also hold these people you're voting accountable. So show up to meetings, make those phone calls. And I think people are seeing that with, um, with what's going on with the civil unrest that is spread across the world right now is that um, uh, people are seeing the, the byproduct and the results of activity. Because there are small changes, you know, there haven't been sweeping changes yet, but there have been some victories that have been created, you know. And so I think the um, the world is seeing the power of, of showing up, you know, and holding accountable, making your voice heard, you know. So I just don't want to see it stop. I don't want. I want to. I, I hope people are paying attention because I think the year twenty twenty is all about 
us seeing ourselves and seeing our true selves, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because 2020 represents perfect vision. Mm -hmm. um, so if, I don't think anybody, there's any shortage of us being forced to deal with each other and see each other yeah. what's going on this year, you know? So I, I just I just hope those things aren't being lost and then that momentum keeps going. Yeah. So speaking about, about, you know, the civil unrest and um, the world that was created, um, the, the momentum around the Black Lives Matter movement that was um, escalated a, a, as a result of, of us seeing a police officer kneel on the neck of George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, the world got to see that injustice in action and it's created this, this global conversation around how do we create more equality? How do we, how do we deal with injustice and how do we create an anti-racist society which is something i never even thought about anti-racist you know like we're i I'm, you know racism bad but now we're now there's this conversation around creating an anti-racist society so education plays a part in that i feel like education is the great equalizer i think that our schools can can combat so many of society's ills if our schools are properly equipped and prepared with the resources that they need. You have to start preparing a classroom in this, in this, um, in this, in the midst of this civil unrest, in the middle of this conversation around Black Lives Matter, um, addressing social justice. Um, there's conversations around how do we improve our curriculums and in 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 inequities in our curriculum? Um, um, people of color being able to see their stories and see themselves in the education curriculum. Um, how are you? How are you approaching that? Are you? Is is this going to change how you approach your classroom at all, or or is this going to add something new to the content that you bring into your classroom? You know, honestly, it will. And, and I'm embarrassed to say that because it shouldn't. But unfortunately, as a teacher and as a Black woman, um, we don't have a lot of the freedoms that other people do. And that's just a reality, unfortunately. So I have worked to make people around me comfortable at times instead of doing the things that I felt I would like to do. Mm. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm tiptoeing around this a little bit, but I think it's an important conversation to have. And, and it's sad that it has to happen, but you know, the reality, I mean, even just my hairstyle, like I, I haven't been able to wear my hair like this in a classroom. And because of the things that are going on, I think people are just more accepting now. And I'm excited that I will be able to wear my hair in braids the whole school year if that's what I choose to do. And it's, it shouldn't be that. Like, I should have been comfortable to be who I choose to be all the time. But I knew, unfortunately, that that wouldn't make other people comfortable. So I did what I thought was would make everybody comfortable, even and though. You know, and, and, yeah, and you know what, and that, that's a reality. Well, yeah. I, what I call it is code switching. Yes. Um, there was a point in my life prior to me hopping off of the hamster wheel of, of corporate America and trying to fit in to other people's systems. When I decided to launch Million Dollar Teacher Project, it was, it was really, I really decided to create my own system and to, um, and to create a, um, and to be a part of creating a world where my authentic voice was heard. Uh, so that was a very intentional decision of mine uh, because I, because I was a victim of it as well. You know, we code switch and we, and we, and we, um, at times can be overly considerate yeah. of, of, of not being threatening. Yeah. You know, and and making other cultures or other people comfortable. Yeah. Now, I do, I do think as human beings, we should be considerate and we should be sensitive, but we should never have to dim our light to make you feel comfortable. Right. I shouldn't have to downplay my blackness 
to make you feel like I'm okay. I shouldn't have to speak a little bit more properly than I normally do. So you're not um, um, looking at, at me and my community in a negative light, because I think what we also have is that burden um, we represent everybody. <laughs> we represent everybody. And I might be the only black person you come across. And I don't want you to feel, you know, prevent an opportunity for another brother or sister from coming in this door. Yeah. When the reality is like we're not a monolith. Exactly. And I